clap of praise tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. He's a miracle worker. I said he's a miracle worker. Anybody need any miracles in here tonight? Woo! Hallelujah. 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 Well, I feel the presence of the Lord in here. Amen. I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost working in this sanctuary tonight. Amen. Amen. Would you just lift up your hands one more time? Ooh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Shut up, shut up. Rest in this house tonight. Jesus, rest upon your people. Let your work and your will be accomplished. Woo! Huh. Well, I feel it. I feel something special in this house right now. I feel something stirring right now. Would you just stir up that gift inside of you just for a minute? Paul said to Timothy, stir up the gift of God that is within you. I feel like somebody ought to stir it up inside of you right now. God wants to do something supernatural for somebody in this house tonight. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise God. I thank the Lord for the privilege to be in this house tonight. I'm thankful for his anointing power that is so real and so evident in this sanctuary. I don't know what your need may be tonight that you've brought into this sanctuary, but I promise you, if you'll give it to Jesus tonight, you'll leave here with your need met. That much I know for certain. If you'll give your need to Jesus, you can cast your cares on him, the Bible said, because he careth for you. Hallelujah. Praise God. I feel such a sweet moving of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I'm so thankful for all of you that are here tonight, midweek service. Amen. And Everybody say Monday night. Next Monday night. I don't know if they put it on the screen. I don't even know if we told them. But next Monday night is midweek service. Amen. At 7 o'clock. So if you'd make that adjustment to your schedule and bring everybody you can find with you to church. Amen. We're going to have a move of God next Monday night. Amen. But we're going to have a move of God tonight. Matter of fact, God's already moving tonight. Woo! If you've got a need, you come to the right place. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. What, what an honor it is for me tonight to have two of my dearest friends in church with us. Pastor St. Clair from Anderson, Indiana, who is no stranger to this pulpit. Apostolic Lighthouse loves you. And then Pastor Nathan Thornton from West Monroe, Louisiana. Didn't he preach Sunday morning? Oh, we heard a word from heaven Sunday. Amen. And Pastor Thornton, we want you to come, and whatever God has given to you, you we want you to give it to us. How many is going to help the preacher tonight? Praise God. God bless you, Brother Thornton. Come on, let's give that to the Lord. Why don't you add your voice with it? Lift up your voice above that hand clap. Give him some high praise. Let's give, I'm talking about, let's give him some high praise. Come on, let's give him some high praise. Do you love him in this place today? Do you love him in this place today? Oh, sweet Jesus. Good. How many of you believe the Lord is good? Man, I said that wrong. I get conviction every time I say that. The Lord is great. And he's greatly to be praised. Come on, do you believe that tonight? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. If you got your Bibles, the book of Luke, chapter 22, 
We'll go to verse 31. God is so faithful to us. Man, what a crowd. Nobody wants to have church midweek no more. Look at this place. It's filled up. Balcony's about to be filled up. God's moving. And uh, folks get the Holy Ghost on an accident in this place. And uh, I tell you what, I, 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 saw, I saw pastor's uh, dog, and I was shocked that thing wasn't meowing by the time it walked out of here uh, that night. And uh, what an incredible presence of God. You folks, you folks, our first class had the privilege uh, to teach the next step class. What an incredible full house there. What incredible. What God's doing around here is absolutely intentional. And, uh, and you know what? God don't plan to stop doing it. And, uh, amen. How I many you going to let the Lord just keep on filling folks with the Holy Ghost? Putting them down in the name of Jesus? Come on, you believe it? <laughs> well, I wasn't planning to be here tonight. Pastor, he, before, he, he said, could, I said, yes. Praise these folks. My God have mercy. I just live here. And uh, absolutely, it's just been incredible. Luke chapter 22, I love Pastor, his wife, their family, the whole family. Just precious people of God. And uh, I love his, his, his absolute desire to see the work of God go forth. He loves this church. Sister Smith loves this church. Their family loves this church. Hey, hey, I'm going to just tell you something. Y'all got the best. I'm telling you, you got the real deal in a pastoral family that loves God and loves you, and uh, he ain't said one negative thing about this church. He ain't, he's not, I'm telling you right now, the devil's a liar. He ain't said anything but what God's doing. That's a man of God. I'm telling you, he loves you folks. And every time we talk about this church, the tears swell up in his eyes and just, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. I just want you to know, you don't have a, you don't just have a preacher. You've got a pastor. You've got a man of God. Amen. The book of Luke chapter 22. Now, let me just say this. You've got two of the greatest preachers in Pentecost in this building tonight. And Pastor Smith and Pastor St. Clair. Now, let me just say something. I've gone all over the world to hear my friend preach. This is the first time he's had to drive out of his driveway to hear me preach. I don't have people make me stay in West Monroe. They don't ever let me preach anywhere. And he he finally got to return the favor to me tonight. That's that's one of my favorite preachers and my closest friend. And uh, I love he, and they, I love him, his wife, his girls. They're just incredible people. And if he's ever, if he's ever preached here, you know what kind of preacher he is. <laughs> Unbelievable. And uh, good to have Eric here. Miss my family, miss my wife. I know she's watching tonight. And uh, she's going to see if she's heard it. And if she has, she's just going to turn it off probably. But uh, she hadn't heard this in a long, long time. Luke chapter 22. Man, I feel the Lord in this place. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 22, verse 31, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for thee, that thy faith, everybody say that, thy faith, that it will, when you fail, that I pray that your faith will not fail. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. I want to talk to you tonight from this thought, and I'm telling you, I know the Lord is in what I'm going to preach tonight. I feel his presence here. Uh, I promise you, if you'll lean in, God's going to talk to you tonight. I want to talk to you from this thought tonight, what to protect after failure. What to protect after failure. Would you put your Bibles down, lift your hands with me, and let's ask the Lord to help us in this place today. Father, I feel your glory in this house tonight. 
God, I bind every spirit of doubt and fear, confusion in his spirit that would exalt itself above your knowledge. I pray, God, that you would subdue it. There would be dominion in this place, strong conviction strong faith. Let the anointing of the Lord move in this house, Lord, and we bind God anything that would try to oppose it. We lose faith, peace, understanding, the power of the Spirit. Let it work tonight, and we'll give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Would you put your hands together? Would you lift up your voice, and let's give God some praise. Come on, would you praise him like you love him? <laughs> Hallelujah! 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 Somebody shout hallelujah. Hey Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much for standing. You may be seated in Jesus' name. 31 years of ministry, 28 years full time. I know I don't even look that old. Probably the greatest issue or one of the things that I wish I could change is how I have dealt with failure in my own life and with others. Pastoring's not easy because when you look at people, sometimes you can see what they need and somehow you have to convince them to walk away from what they want. It's not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing because the truth is, whether you realize it or not, when a pastor uh, has such a great congregation and they love their church. When they look at you, it's not that they look down on you, but you pull a string in their heart that they would do anything to make sure that you receive the best things in life. There's a crazy story in 2 Samuel. I promise you I'm going to get a little bit quicker here in a minute, but there's a crazy story in 2 Samuel chapter 4. Verse 4, it gives us a little insight about Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son. And the Bible said that, that they had received the tidings of the news about Saul and Jonathan and that the nurse said, if I'm going to save Mephibosheth, I've got to get him out of here. And this nurse, which was the nurturer, she was the life source. She was the protector of him. She was dedicated to making sure he was okay. She jerked him up, and in haste, she dropped him, trying to save his life. The truth is, I can tell you over the years of ministry that there's been people in haste that I've tried to pick up and trying to get them out of sin's way and I dropped them. Broke my heart, broke my spirit. But I, I, I look at this text a little bit different because I'm going to tell you something. When God saves people, when God pulls them out, the Bible teaches us that you can go to heaven without an offended eye. You can go to heaven if that hand offends you and you cut it off. And I believe I'm looking at people tonight that within every part of their being, you want to be saved or you wouldn't be in this place tonight. You are here because you feel something. You feel a drawing of the presence of God and there's faith that is trying to move in your life and God has gotten your attention somewhere and that's why you're here tonight. But I want you to know Isaiah said that hell hath enlarged her mouth 
and it's got an appetite and you're on the menu and Satan desires to destroy you. He wants to take everything he can from you. He wants to destroy you to a point where you have no faith to receive what God has for you. And the Lord looked at Simon Peter and said, let me tell you something, buddy. He said, you're going to fail, but I want you to understand that even if you fail, your faith doesn't have to fail. Oh, yeah. Why? Why does the devil hate faith so much? You want to know why the devil hates faith so much? He knows there's not a person in this world, not just in this room, but there's not a person on this planet that doesn't have the measure of faith. Can I tell you, and I know this might be a little controversial, and, and if I'm wrong, I, I'll just admit I'm wrong, but I'm telling you, I believe everybody starts with the same amount of faith. I believe everybody's not got a measure, but they've got the measure of faith. And he knows, he knows, he knows that if you've got faith, anything is possible. And he's got some of you convinced when you look over your life that God's not anywhere in it. And, and God is wanting the best or the worst for you. And he's closed his ears to your prayer and closed his eyes to your life. But I've come to tell you tonight, that's a lie of the devil. You've got the measure. I said, you've got the measure of faith. And I'm going to tell us, it can, come on, it can start in the bar room. It can start in a denominal church. And by God, it can start in this building tonight. Faith can start anywhere. Somebody said, I think it'll start right here, right now. I think I'll just let my faith start in this place tonight. Come on, it can start anywhere at any time. And he knows that that faith is his worst nightmare. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. You've got the measure. And it can be ignited at any time. But I'm going to tell you what really makes him upset. Was it the smallest of faith? Everybody says that grain as a mustard seed. He said it wasn't talking about the size. No, it was talking about the process. But it was telling us the smallest of faith can move the biggest of mountains. Oh my God, have mercy. I'm putting a priest of paint off the walls in this place right now. You look up here right now. The devil knows if you got 1% faith, it can outlive and outmove 99% doubt. I don't need you to have strong faith. I need you just to use the faith that you've got tonight. Well, I don't know. I'm telling you, you got enough faith to get out of that situation. You got enough faith to see a move of the Spirit. You got enough faith for God to answer. You got enough faith to get that miracle. You got enough faith to get the Holy Ghost. He don't like it. He don't like, he don't like the fact that you ain't got to, you could have walked in here struggling. But if you walked in, yeah. if you walked in sick, yeah. I need you, you're going to walk out healed. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You're not hearing me. Some of you are sucking your thumb right now. You need to get your thumb out of your mouth. I don't care if it's 99% bad. If there's 1% faith left, the devil can't stop you. Come on, he can't stop the miracle power. Come on, he can't stop you getting the Holy Ghost. All you got to do is say, hey, I believe. I might not believe a whole lot, but I believe a little, and a little's more than all that doubt in the world. You know what I, yeah. Let me just tell you something. My, my parents got divorced when I was 17. I've been in church about, about a year. 
And uh, I was living with my grandparents. Ooh, you folks got me out of breath. Usually you can preach slower and then get fiery. And I, 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 I walked in that house. They signed them papers. I walked in that house. And my grandmother prayed three times a day. And my grandmother was in there pleading the blood over my mom and daddy. I walked in there. I was mad. I'm telling you, I was mad. I swung that door open. Her bedroom, she's praying in her prayer chair. Her cushion had been rotted out with tears. When she died, I only wanted one thing. I just wanted that chair. Yeah. Anyway, my family watching, y'all better pray through over that. <laughs> I walked down, swung that door, and she turned her head. She was praying. She just looked sideways. I said, get up! It's over. They signed the divorce papers. You can stop praying. She jumped up like a 12-year-old girl. She walked up to me and she pointed that finger, Pastor. I'm not going to do it to you, but she pointed right in, right in my nose. And she said, I'm going to tell you something. If I'd have listened to that spirit, your Aunt Brenda and Uncle Buddy wouldn't be in church. Your Aunt Linda and Uncle Billy Ray wouldn't be in church. Your cousin Dwayne and Gary. Come on, your cousins Valerie and Karen. She, she said, none of them. If I don't listen to that spirit, none of them would be in that church. And I'm going to tell you what she said. And she said, you sorry devil. You can shut your mouth and walk out of this room just like you walked in. Come on, you got to get some grit about you. I don't care what it looks like. I'm telling you, you got enough faith. You can have it. It can happen. Don't you get discouraged. Don't you stop praying. Don't you stop running. Don't you stop rolling. Don't you stop crying. You don't need a whole lot. You know, you can have bad evidence, but have good prayer. Yeah. 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 Some of you don't realize the smallest of faith can move the biggest of mountains. It don't take great faith. It don't take great faith to do that. And the Lord looked at Simon Peter and said, let me tell you something, Simon Peter. You're going to fail. You're going to fail. He said, I want you to know that I know you're going to fail. Let me tell you something. God didn't plan your failure. He planned your recovery. In the name of Jesus, yes, he did. Uh, you walked out on your own lust. But thank God he had a plan for you to come back home. I got any prodigals in this building that still believe God brings people back home. I've got anybody that's ever walked out of church that can say tonight, I know that I know that he'll bring you back to this house. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to shut the door on you. He's not going to walk away from you. I'm telling you, he's going to let you come back home. He's going to bring you back in the house. I never understood this. He's prophesying his failure. But he's not prophesying his failure to give glory in the failure. He's prophesying the failure to give him instruction to recover. That's it. My God, all right. So I got to dig it. And I want to know, what do you mean by don't let your faith fail? What, what does that mean? Faith is a broad word. I mean, you start looking in that, in that Bible, you find all kinds of faith. I mean, all kinds. You, I, you're only going to find about four or five stages of fear. But you're going to find over 100 stages of faith. In fact, it's probably bigger than that because we live by faith. We walk by faith. Go there. From what? From faith to everything's faith. What do you mean? What are you saying to him? And I got to looking at that word. And when I started searching that word, I found out there was three areas that he was speaking to Simon Peter. And he said, Let me, he said, Simon Peter, he said, when you fail, these three areas can't fail. 
The first one is a pretty good one. All three of them are. But this, one, this one right here, you need to thank God for it. You want to know what the first one was? Conviction. He said, when you fail, whatever you do, protect your conviction. <laughs> Why? Why? Because it's conviction that smites that heart. It's conviction that when this praise team is singing praises and they're worshiping God, tears, you don't even know why your eyes are filling up with tears. But it, it, it is conviction that gets a hold of you and makes you want to kind of white knuckle those pews just a little bit and say, I don't know why. You won't know why you're feeling what you're feeling because God wants you to step out on that 1% faith. If you're going to fail, you got to protect your conviction. I need it. I need it. I need to hold on to my convictions. I don't need to just let everything go. Hey, you messed up once. Don't let down every fence in your life. Don't walk away from everything that has protected you. Come on, don't open yourself up to every devil. Protect it. I want you to think about this. David. David should have been at war, but he's on a rooftop. David sees this beautiful woman. David messes up. The lady gets pregnant. And David decides, I'm just to cover my own sin. And he brings Uriah home and he says, hey, go to your house. I'm going to give you a few days rest. Go to your house and get with your wife. And, and, and I, you ain't seen her in a long time. Go, go be, but, but Uriah, Uriah, which means the light of God. Uriah said, I ain't going nowhere. I'm going to sleep at your door. And conviction slept at the door of David. And when he'd wake up in the morning, conviction would be there. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, thank God. Thank God when conviction is sleeping in our lives. Stay in front of us. Well, we can't get you. Said, man, the devil's reminding me of you of my mistake. You ought to use that as the grace of God and say, let me show you how much I love him. Oh, yeah. I'm not going. You want to know what? David got mad about it. Yeah. Yeah. David got mad about the conviction. He got mad. He said, I got to turn this light out. I got to get rid of the voice of conviction. Yeah. So he, he advised a plan. He had Uriah killed. But God, in his love and mercy, said, you might have killed. You might have killed Uriah. You might have killed conviction. You might have shut the light off. But I've got a prophet. <laughs> That prophet, he'll come up and he'll start pointing things out and start. This church knows about a prophet. This church has got a prophet. <laughs> this, this, this church, are you hearing me tonight? Y'all think pastor just got up and got on sermoncentral.com and printed out a sermon and he gets up there and he starts preaching things and you're like, what in the world? You said, I don't even feel it, but you know it sounds like what is happening in your life. You want to know why? Because you've cut the voice off conviction and God said, I'm going to reach for you one more time with the voice of a prophet. Gonna go after you one more time with the voice of a prophet. And that prophet starts preaching and starts telling you, hey, come on. You need to get, you know you're not doing right. You know, you know that's not right. You need to come on back to the family. You need to come on back to you need to get your conviction back. You know what some of you need to do? You know you might not feel conviction, but you got enough muscle memory to start rebuilding some fences tonight. You ought to say, I might not feel it, but the prophetic word is going for. And I'm gonna. I might not feel it. I might not feel it. But the prophet spoke. God spoke. And I've got some muscle memory. My grandmother said, son, there's three things you better learn how to do. She said, first thing you better learn how is you better understand repentance is a gift and not a curse. She said, it ought to be the thing that you love the most to be able to go on your knees and throw your hands up in the Lord and say, God, wash me again. 
when it talked about that blood, it says it cleanseth from sin. It just keeps on working. It never runs out. And I'm telling you, you ought to fall in love repentance. You know what else she said? She said, the second thing is when you repent, you need to believe that. I don't care if ever devil in hell tells you God hadn't forgiven you. If you repent, God forgives. Come on, if you repent, God forgives. She said that third thing. She said, you need to learn how to worship God. And I'm telling you, she grabbed me on a Sunday morning, and I was ready to quit, go play go play uh, junior college baseball, walk away from it. I told Brother Dean, I'll be the best saint you got. To, I, I, I'm going to I'm gonna go Bipsy. I'm going to play baseball. I'm going to get Bible studies. But that was a lie from the devil. And when I told my bishop that, he jumped across his desk. He grabbed me by my shirt, and he said, oh, no, sir, you're not welcome to do that. But I was standing. I was on that second pew of that church, and my grandmother grabbed me. And she said, Nathan, you might not feel like it, but you know how to do it. Because she said, you got to learn how to worship God. She said, because if you learn how, even when you don't feel like it, you can still do it. Oh, I'll, hey, I'm going to tell you the best kind of dancing is when you don't feel like it. The best kind of running is when you don't feel like it. The best time to lift up your hands is when all of hell is fighting against you. And you say, hey, I know how to do this. I've learned how to worship. I might not feel it, but I know how to do it. But you got to keep, somebody say, I got to keep my conviction. Now, now, listen to me. The second issue of faith he was dealing with Simon Peter. He said, he said Simon Peter, you can't lose faith in yourself. Yeah. 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 How many of you hate labels? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he'll never matter nothing. I remember I had a cousin. So let me tell you just how this cousin was. Jordan, one time he's telling me this hunting story. He went in this place on his four-wheeler, and he said an alligator started after him. I'm telling you the truth. He said, he said, you know, alligators can run 60 miles an hour. I'm like, I didn't know that. He said, you got to run zigzag to get away from him. He said he zigzagged, jumped on the four-wheeler, got on that four-wheeler, and that alligator was running behind him. He said that alligator jumped up and bit that four-wheeler seat. Now, as you can see, you got to wear your waders. He prayed through every Sunday at our church. He'd throw cigarettes at the altar, and he'd walk out. Next Sunday, he'd throw three packs at the altar. Walk out. And, and he had prayed through like for a month, all Sundays. And we're sitting at Catfish King, eating some food, and one of my cousins decided to be a little sarcastic about him praying through that morning. And they said, well, man, I better not call his name. He said... He said, oh, so-and-so, he, uh, he prayed through again. And they started laughing. I could see my grandmother. She never stopped eating. She said, yep, and if he prays through on Sunday, next Sunday, you better have your hide down there praying with him. And here's what she said, because she said, you never know when it's going to stick. <laughs> Do you know, do you know Richard's in church right now? He ain't smoking cigarettes. He ain't partying out in the world. His wife's in church. Oh, I said his name. His kids are in church. You want to know why? Because, hey, it might stick one day. I don't care if you got to pray through every Sunday, every Tuesday, every Sunday, every Tuesday. You need to get up and say, hey, I'm not an alcoholic anymore. I'm not a drug addict anymore. I'm not messed up anymore. God's got some... stick this time. It's gonna stick this time. It's gonna work. It's gonna work. It's gonna work. It's gonna work. Can, can I tell one more? I, I'm, man, I'm preaching way too long. 
can I tell one more story and get, before I get to the next one? We had this dude, we had this lady walk in. It was my, my great aunt walked in my house. And I, if you don't believe in cards, I'm sorry. But my grandparents were playing Kanaska. They were playing. And she got talking about my bishop, about how he was letting this guy, this family counselor, he'd come to our church. He had a ponytail down here behind his knees. And he got in church. He was a drug addict. He was going through a divorce. He's, he's canceling families. He's going through all this mess. He's telling other families what to do. And my great aunt got on, got on my bishop. She said, I can't believe he would let him run around them aisles like that. He sees that ponytail. That's a disgrace. I want to just walk up there and I want to cut that ponytail off. And I'm telling you the truth. One Sunday morning, it got to moving in our church. We got risers in the back of my home church. And my great aunt would sit on that front seat of that riser. And old Stacy, he got to running around them aisles. And when he turned that corner, that old ponytail, I'm telling you, Lord, if it didn't happen, I'm telling you, that old ponytail slapped my great aunt right in her mouth. I didn't feel it, but I felt it out. You know when God shows up. That takes God. Don't look at me. I know I'm in, I can preach this because I'm in a church that knows that this works. Do you know Stacy's a United Pentecostal preacher right now? Come on, do you know he gives people Bible studies, baptize them in Jesus' name, and make it the Holy Ghost at his altars? Don't you tell me it can't work. You gotta get some faith inside of you. You, you gotta muster up some faith and no, 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 no. I'm not gonna be that person no more. God can come. I don't have to live like this. I don't have to live with discouragement, depression, and fear and failure. I'm not this person anymore. Listen, then, I, 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 need to, I need to get to the next one. Just hold on. I, I promise you I'm almost through. You walking in it. Hey, Peter, the apostle Peter, man, he messed up. He failed God. It was prophesied. The Lord comes, stands on the shore. He's calling out to a boat. Hey, have you any meat? Cast your, set, your nets on the right side. See, here's what I like about that. He didn't tell him move up 20 degrees south, go 40 degrees east, go 50 degrees north, and go 35 degrees east. He said, just throw your nets on the right side. Because, see, what you don't understand with God, it's not about where you are right now. It's just a matter of where you're throwing your net. The position's fine. You just need to try the right thing. Man, they throw them net that get filled up with fish. Peter's like, who in the world is there? And it had to be John. John said, my God, that's the Lord over there. Peter puts his coat on. He jumps in that water, and he starts swimming. Now, I know there's two different types of love that Jesus was asking him when he said, Thou lovest me. The first two was a, was a, was a, was a shallow kind of love. And the third one, the, 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 the third time he asked, it was the deepest kind of love. I understand the difference of loves that he was using right there. But I do want to note something. He asked him three times, and somebody said, Why did he ask him three times? Because he failed three times. Now, I'm fixing to crush a I'm fixing to crush a myth that the devil tells people. See, people think if they fail, that means they didn't love. But Jesus wanted Peter to know, I know you love me even though you failed me. I want you to know every time you messed up, I saw that love in your heart. And the world might throw you away, but I'm not going to throw you away. People might say you can't, but I'm not going to say you can't. And I'm going to tell you, it's possible to love him and still fail him. But somebody in this building needs to stand up and say, devil, I love him. He's the best thing that ever happened to me. He's the greatest thing that's ever happened in my life. You gotta protect your conviction. You gotta protect the faith that God has given you to have in yourself. 
I want you to look at somebody and say, you can do it. Come on, tell them you can live for God. You can come out of this. God can use you. God can do something in your life. God is going to touch you. Come on, musicians, I'm almost through. This last one. He said, you got to protect your conviction. You got to protect the love that you have for yourself or the faith that you have in yourself. He said, but third, the third kind of faith is the greatest of all faith. You got to believe and keep your faith in God no matter where you're at. See, faith can start anywhere. You know what the Bible says? This is like the Bible, the Bible, the KG Bible, KG, KJV Bible. This is in the Bible. Look at your neighbor and say, this is in the Bible. He said, it's impossible to please God without faith. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. What is he? He's the God of any in any situation and anywhere you are at. You're, you're looking at me like you don't believe it. He's God in the bar room. He's God in the drug house. He's God walking down the street with no home to go back to. He's God in your great, uh, he's God in your great 500 four country, uh, fortune company. He's God anywhere you believe that he is. And if you believe that he is tonight, he's going to be that is God to you right now. But he didn't stop there. He said, because people that can find out who I am, they know that I'm a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I'm telling you, somebody ought to say, I know that he is. Come on, no, you got to say it. I know that 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 he is. He is a deliverer. He is a healer. He's been my refuge. He's been my savior. He's a God that he is. Come on, I want you to shake somebody and say, oh, yes, he is. No, you got to say, oh, yes, he is. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, yes, he is. I promise you, I'm almost through. I know, I know, I know we can get caught up in the storms of life. Peter started sinking. He, he was walking on water. He did what no man had ever done. He's the only one that got rebuked, too. He walked on that water, and when he got caught up in life, and we all have the ability to get caught up in life, and we start drowning. He didn't look up there and blame God foolishly. He didn't look up there and say, oh, you didn't love me. He didn't look up there and say, I ain't got no faith in you. He knew if he was going to be saved that it was going to take the hand of God. Do you realize you can trip walking on water? <laughs> you can sink walking on water. But when you know that you know that he is, you'll throw, your, you'll throw your eyes up to him and you'll reach your hand and say, save me again, God. <laughs> Pick me up out of this place. <laughs> Woo! Pick me up. Come on, pick me up out of this place. I'm looking at people. I'm telling you right now. You look at this preacher right now. You want to know why this church loves you? They really love you. It ain't fake. They're not doing this to report numbers. They love you. You want to know why? Because they know who he is. And these people that's been shouting and these... And they look like they got nice clothes. They ain't always had nice ones. There's been times. Pastor, you told that story about you, about that, that lady saving your life when you walked in there. Have you told that this, this church? That age? Well, I'm not. I'm going to let you tell it. You know, we get broken. 
God can send people to remind us. I'll, I'll let him preach it when he wants to. But I've been broken. Oh, yeah. I remember one night, I, we were getting sued. I was getting sued personally. Church was getting sued. Trustees, stuff we didn't even do. The person that did everything was suing us. And God had given me a word, said, you can't fight. If you ever fight, he stopped fighting for me. You know how, you know how hard it is when, 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 when things are coming after you not to fight. But do you know how pure a prayer that you can find when you choose to be a lover of God and not a fighter of men? Now, hold on. My wife will tell you. We've got some bad news. Forgive me tonight. We'd gotten some bad news. I walked in that house. I was, my shoulders were bent over. I was pale. My heart was pounding. I didn't know what to do. I had this office with no room, no, no windows in it. It's my private office in my house, my old house. I looked at her and she said, are you okay? I said, I'm fine, baby. I said, I'm gonna just go in this room for a little bit. I walked in that room, I shut that door, I turned them lights on. I laid on that couch like he was my counselor. <laughs> and I started telling him everything that was going wrong. Bishop, the more I started telling him what was going wrong, I would mess up. I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost, I am not, I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost, I'm telling you the truth. Every time I'd tell him something that was going wrong, my mouth would speak two or three things that was going right. Then I'd go back telling him something was going wrong. Then I'd say two or three. And I was like, what in the world is going on in the Lord come in that place? And he covered me, and I'll never forget what he said. He said, Nathan. If all of this is going right and there's more going right than there is wrong, why do you think, why do you think that's really wrong? Maybe it's right. I don't know if that hit you, but I knew what God was saying to me. I knew what he was saying to me. Here's what he was saying. He was saying, son, just trust me a little bit. I know what I'm doing. And see, some of you are looking at your life and all you can do right now is trace the hail that goes back in your past. But what you need to do is open to your eyes to where you're at. Maybe not everything is as bad as you think it is right now. Maybe there's a lifeline in this house tonight. Maybe God is saying, hey, I got some things. I'm not going to let your faith fail. I'm not going to let you walk out of this place. I'm not going to let you die lost. I'm not going to let them drugs overtake your life. I got you here for a reason because you might have failed. But I've come to tell you, I've given you some lifelines in failure. I've given you conviction. I've put some faith inside of your heart. Come on, you can do this. And you know who I am and you know I can save. Come on, I'm telling you, when you go through the fire, you're not going to be burned. When you find yourself in the water, it's not going to overtake you. Somebody in this building ought to stand up and say, hey, 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 I know my God is in this place tonight. I know, I know he's here. Come on, look at somebody and say, I know it. Come on, look at somebody and say, I know it. I know it. I know it. I'm officially give an altar call. I want you to lift your hands just for a few moments before I do it tonight. God, I prayed you'd give me favor with people tonight. I prayed that you would open my voice to these hearts tonight. I pray, God, that they would feel what I feel in this place, the love and the mercy of God.
I pray, God, that they'd feel that tonight. Here's what I want. Here's what I want if some of you are exhausted with wrestling with failure. You're exhausted with wrestling with things reminding you of who you, who you used to be, not who you are today. If you've been wrestling and you've, you're weary with failure in your life, you're weary with some of these things that have attached itself to you, I want you to step out of those pews tonight. I want you to come get in front of this altar right here. Come on. You don't have to be afraid. We're fixing to pray for you. You don't have to be afraid. We're fixing to ask the Lord to touch it tonight. You don't have to be afraid. You can walk in this place tonight. God can touch you. Some of my altars, workers, would you find some people we're fixing to pray right now? Would you just lift your hands to the Lord from the back to the front? Would you help me, precious people? Would you help me tonight? Would you lift up your hands and lift up your voice tonight? Failure's not going to win this battle. Failure's not going to win this battle. 